All right, so respiratory. I feel respiratory is, is a blue in color. So we're going to be talking about uh, COPD and asthma. Those are the two big respiratory diseases we're going to be talking about. Uh, there are other ones out there, but uh, this we give kind of framework of hypoxia and hypercapnia, right? So again, hypoxia is low O2, right? And hypercapnia is high CO2. COPD has both, right? There's two varieties of COPDs. There's a third variety too, but there's the two primary varieties have low O2 or they have high CO2. And so that's COPD, right? And we'll talk about asthma. And asthma is a... Uh, O2 problem primarily, and when they have a CO2 problem, that's actually a medical emergency. An asthma patient should never be hypercapnic. That's a sign that they are decompensating. They're not breathing fast enough, right? Or they're not breathing, taking enough volume in because CO2 goes up or down when you breathe fast. It goes down, right? You blow off CO2. And if you can't get the air into your airways, or if someone's getting weak and tired because they're breathing fast for a long time, that's the problem where you get an elevated CO2. So that means ABGs are making an ugly return, right? Whoever loves ABGs, you know, you're going to start applauding. But if you don't like ABGs, I'm sorry. That that's, you know, respiratory it deals with ABGs, right? So you have to recognize, is this patient in trouble or not, right? So you got an asthma patient, they do an ABG, and it shows a CO2 that's high. That's a medical emergency. But you got a COPD patient, the CO2 is high. It might be their baseline. That might be where they live. Right? So we're going to make, adjust the normals, actually, for COPDers. COPDers can live at a high CO2. So instead of what's normal CO2? Something to something. What is the normal? 35 to 45, right? So a COPD patient might live at 60 or 70 CO2. That's their baseline. So we have to calculate what their baseline might be. So asthma overview, all right? So asthma is reactive airway disease, another name for it. So it's where the airway gets inflamed for some reason, right? Usually it's a trigger of some sort. So there's a trigger out there that's causing the airways to obstruct, to be reactive and close shut, right? So here's a normal airway and here's an asthma airway. You can notice that the diameter has uh, dropped dramatically. Right? Don't, I don't know why I'm doing alliteration right now, but either way, they're, they're, you have a, a squeezing of the airways and air cannot get in. Right? It's an upper airway problem. It's not an alveolus problem. It's not a lower bronchial problem. It's a airway problem. Okay? Upper airway problem. So our problem here is we want to avoid risk factors. Risk factors are what are causing a, this asthma to exist. Right? And also, it's kind of their fault, too. They're, they're overreactive. There's something that's making their lungs more reactive than others, right? And we'll talk about the next slide about the pathophys, about why they're overreactive, right? Happens in childhood and adults, so you'll kind of revisit this in peds. Talk more about AB, uh, not ABGs, but uh, with um, pediatric asthma and, and such. But uh, with the higher the, you get in age, the more risk you are of having deadly bronchoconstriction. Okay, it's, been, it's quite common, 18 million Americans, right? That's about that's half the population of California. All right, so risk factors. So family history of asthma puts you at risk for having asthma. If you have uh, frequent respiratory infections like flu and pneumonia, that's going to put you at risk as well of uh, chronic uh, inflammation of the lungs. Your lungs are going to get hypersensitized to getting uh, asthma attacks. Okay. And then atopic dermatitis, that's just an association with asthma. Some, some kids like, oh, they always have eczema. They always have these, these, these scaly rashes. So with, when they have that, that is, that's puts them at risk for also having asthma. Okay. And then allergic rhinitis, nasal polyps, these are other rare things, not rare things, but commonalities when they have nasal polyps, you hear someone, oh, I got nasal polyps, that's they're probably at risk for asthma as well. But more commonly, that's, that we could test you on, is they have environmental triggers, right? There's irritants in the in the environment that are causing their asthma to flare up, right? We'll talk about why it flares up, but these are the things that make it flare up. So obviously for teaching, we're gonna say, don't get irritated, right? Don't let your airways get irritated. So exercise can induce asthma. So just exercise in itself, right? So usually we teach them, you take a bronchodilator and take a protective or a, um, what's it called? What's the word I'm looking for? Not resistant, but a, I'm thinking, I can't think of the, the name, but there's, we have three different classes of, of uh, medications that we use to open up the airways, and it protects the airways, right? So we tell them to take that before the exercise. And then cold weather. So we tell them not to exercise in cold weather. 
or move from New York City or move from Alaska. But cold weather can trigger it, and sometimes we have to make sure they're aware of their function, their, their, their uh, bronchial function, and we can measure that. We have a device that can measure how well their asthma is at baseline right now, right? So we might go, they go to the office and say, hey, this is what your airway function is, and that's the green zone. And then there's a yellow zone and a red zone. They can check themselves and see if that is, if they're at risk, if they should go out and exercise or not, right? That's called a peak flow meter, so we'll talk about that. And then there's stress. Stress can put someone over the edge into causing asthma. There's medical reasons. Like we mentioned, you can get asthma, develop it from having frequent rest respiratory infections, but also just having a viral pneumonia or viral influenza or even bacterial for that matter, that can cause, or bacterial pneumonia, that can cause a, uh, someone's asthma to flare up. And when asthma flares up, just like when CHF flares up or myasthenia gravis flares up, it's called a crisis or an asthma acute exacerbation or AE. So an asthma AE, right, is a uh, medical emergency. We have to identify that. And say, if they're going to the hospital, that's a problem. And we have to recognize, A, they're not getting hypercapnic, but B, that they are, uh, you know, are they able to breathe okay, right? Are they able to get air into their lungs? Because we can assess them and say, oh, I don't hear any air entry. You must have a pneumothorax. Or also it could be the airways are completely shut and there's no air getting in at all. And that's a problem, okay? And then sinus infections can put them at risk uh, or can trigger them to get asthma. And then GERD. We'll talk more about GERD next semester with GI, but one of the complications of GERD is asthma. Uh, at night, all those, rest, all those GI secretions make their way up into the upper airways and they get asthma as a, as a result. Okay, so medical triggers and uh, regular triggers, right? So pets, right? So you tell them don't have pets. Just, I'm sorry, you know, Fluffy has to get put down. I'm sorry. No, no. You just have to, you have to say, <laughs> yeah. You have to tell them that, you know, you, you avoid it, right? Make sure that Fluffy does not go outside. If they're not an outdoor cat, there may be an indoor cat. It's not bringing triggers from outside, right? Don't let, don't sleep with Fluffy. Your Fluffy can have their own room, right? That's we got to avoid that. And then airway pol air pollution, right? We have to move move again. And again, so poor socioeconomic status can put us at risk because usually poor socioeconomic status is usually where they build the factories in those places. So that's kind of as an un underserved population, unfortunately, gets more asthma for that reason. And then, uh, what do you think the number one trigger? What's the number one thing that causes someone to have asthma or triggers someone's asthma? Weather? Weather? No. Smoke? Smoke? No, but it's a good idea to avoid secondhand smoke, right? Or smoking in general. An asthma patient should not be smoking, for sure. Dust, dust is up there, it's like number two, number three maybe. Number one, cockroach poop, right? That's the highest, highest on the list, all right? So avoid cockroach poop, make sure your area is clean, right? Make sure you're, 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 you know, you're having, you put out traps and that you're not getting all this dander, right? From cockroaches. And then of course, pollen is a big one, so they, you know, they recommended using HEPA filters in their house and with their HVAC system, make sure they're not getting all these pollutants. If they live in an area like us where we have all these dust storms and all these, uh, you know, it gets super windy in the evenings, that's probably not a great place to, to live, right? Or they need to avoid it or wear masks or whatever they need to do to avoid those triggers, okay? So highest in the list, cockroach poop. So what's the patho? What, how does this happen? So we know there's a trigger that stimulates this, but it stimulates the, the airways to constrict, right? If you notice in the previous picture, it was constricted, and also in asthma, it is more muscular because it's being irritated over time. Just like when we talked about strokes and hypertension, it's like doing donuts in the, in the brain, and it's causing those vessels to get strict more and more muscular, more and more muscular to the point where they don't get flow at all. So kind of the same thing with asthma. You're getting this chronic irritation, this chronic triggering, and the muscle tissue gets bigger and bigger and bigger, beefier and beefier and beefier, right? You get a lot more muscle proliferation, right? So we get, oh, what do we got here? Mucosal edema and also mucosal proliferation, proliferation right? So the other piece is, with asthma is you get not only that the airways bronchoconstrict, but also the airways get full of mucus. You get more mucus production with an asthma, asthmatic and an asthma attack especially. So there's not only do you have all this extra bronchoconstriction, but also all kinds of mucus is being produced as well. And that's going to get in the way of airflow, right? So you've got bronchoconstriction is a problem, mucus is a problem, and we have the muscle getting hypertrophied. It's another problem, all right? So those are our, kind of our targets for medications. We want to stop mucus production, stop the bronchoconstriction, the, the, and then hopefully the, avoid triggers so the, muc the muscles don't grow and grow and grow, all right? So 
we have inflammation and that's and we have inflammation when you stub your toe right your toe gets big and swole right and why does it get swole because that's the inflammatory process it gets the vessels are are designed to vasodilate right and then fluid gets out and moves and they get very very holy not like you know holy but holy as in there's more holes and more it's more permeable and fluid can get out and also white blood cells can get out like macrophages for instance right I mentioned before in a previous lecture that you have, macrophages are in the witness protection program. So they have many different names depending on where they are. In the brain, they're called glial cells. In the uh, random tissues, they're called macrophages. In the lungs, they're called dendritic cells. So you have these dendritic cells which are uh, designed to attack incoming bacteria. They're just sitting there waiting to attack bacteria or viruses or whatever it may be, right? But uh, so that so why did they get there in the first place? Why would they be more there in the first place? Is because they had this chronic triggering, this chronic asthma, right? And when you get a trigger or an asthma attack, more, the, the vessels get leakier and more cells can get inside, right? And more cells can get in there, so we get this bronchial edema as well, mucosal edema, but also bronchial edema, bronchial constriction, mucus hypersecretion, and also we get more edema that develops inside the airways as well. So not only are the airways bronchoconstricted, they're also full of fluid and edema because the, the vascular system right here became more leaky. So you have all that plasma leaked out of that vessel of those bronchioles. And then because of that immune response, we have this vasodilation, this edema, and then part of the immune response is the release of all kinds of inflammatory mediators. So we'll talk about a few of them because these ones we can stop with medications, right? So we have the inflammation, airway edema, the bronchial airways. We're talking about the bronchi right now, not alveoli. Usually alveoli is more COPD, right? You got airway hyperresponsiveness. This irritant is causing this local response, okay? And then it creates an immune response. All right, we'll let the school pass by. So yeah, so this immune response is not just like right now, right now. There are some things where the asthma attack happens now, right? Within zero hours to 30 minutes but also the whole immune system has a whole six to 12 hour response. So sometimes later, like six to 12 hours later, they start getting you know, conjunctivitis, they get red eyes, they get no, nasal symptoms, they get drool, drooling, not drooling so much, but nasal drooling, what's that called? Rod runny nose, or if you're fancy, you call it rhinorrhea, right? Sounds like, <laughs> it sounds like diarrhea, but it's diarrhea of the nose, right? It's just a runny nose, okay? So all that is, those are kind of symptoms of an immune response that's happening. And you get that when you have a viral infection or a, a cold, right? You get that, that's just an immune response. All right, so then we've got the inflammation happening, so that's causing airway edema, and then we have bronchoconstriction, right? We have the airways constricting, right? That's one of the, what happens when you have an immune response is airways constrict. I'm not sure how that, that helps out, but I guess if it's a trigger, you don't want that trigger to get its way down to the lower airways, you'll constrict. There's not a real good explanation for that. But the responsible, responsible parties for bronchoconstriction are our prostaglandins, sorry, our histamine is responsible for bronchoconstriction, right? That's one of the inflammatory mediators, one of the inflammatory chemicals that causes our bronchi to constrict, all right? So we want to stop that, right? And then bronchial hyperplasia and fibrosis. We don't have any medications that fix that extra muscle tissue, but we do have things that can stop bronchoconstriction, things that can stop inflammation, right? and things that can stop mucus production. Because part of that whole immune response is we're going to get the mucus is gonna to start to be get secreted and that's gonna get in the way of our, our airways there, right? So we want to stop that. So that's one of our, our medication pathways, right? We wanna stop bronchoconstriction, stop the mucus production and stop the edema from occurring, okay? So we have to know like, how does that happen? We have mast cells. So mast cells are just another fancy white blood cell that kind of accumulates in tissue. And it accumulates in tissue that's been, in, been invaded before. So mast, you have to think about like where are we starting? Because the mast cells are going to already be there. But the reason why they're there is because they were triggered in the first place. And now we're coming like a day later, a month later, three years later. Right? We have all these mast cells that, that are there. And why the mast cells get there in the first place? They got there from they were prepared for a invading attack. So let's say it was cockroach poop, right? Cockroach poop came, invaded, right? And then now we have, we form an immune response. We get some bronchoconstriction, bronchoedema, and then now we have all the cells inside the, the uh, our dendritic cells that are inside the, um, 
well, inside the muscle, the bronchioles, they're saying, you know what, this is, this is unacceptable. I can't have cockroach poop in here, right? So what they do is say, you know what, let's trigger a whole immune response. So they're going to trigger a whole immune response. They're going to release all kinds of chemicals and chemotoxins and interleukins and leukotrienes and all of these fancy things that are going to go out and trigger the immune response. And what, what happens is the immune system says, oh, that, that, that is a problem. I don't like cockroach poop either. You're right. So they're going to form antibodies, right? Those antibodies are going to attack these allergens. And those antibodies specifically are called IgEs, right? So they're immunoglobulins that are called for allergies, right? So IgE are antibodies that are ready to go, and they will attack cockroach poop the next time it comes around, right? Okay. And then also it says, you know what, that's not enough. Let's have someone just surveying the area and so in case cockroach poop comes around again. So we have mast cells. They're like little security patrols that are ready to go. So mast cells are just right there, ready to go, just in case the next time happens. So now we can start our story. We have a, a prepared mast cell. It's, it's, just, it's just preparing because it knows from last time we're not going to let this happen again. Right? And then now these airways are full of these mast cells and when cockroach poop comes again or exercise comes again or air pollution comes again, these mast cells, not today, right? And they're, gonna, they're going to degranulate. They're going to, it's literally like a car bomb. They're gonna go out there like, ah! And they're going to, and they're gonna, they're gonna burst and they're gonna degranulate and they're going to have uh, all their contents spill everywhere. And their contents are all these other chemotaxins and all these other triggers, and it's going to trigger another immune response to happen to, to you know, now it's gonna, in a day or so, it's going to be even worse. And then also they release IgE, and IgE and mast cells, all this degranulation causes more, tax, uh, more chemicals to do their thing. And histamine and prostaglandins and things, they're ready to go, and those guys are going to do their thing. Histamine bronchoconstricts. Histamine makes, it, makes the vessels here extra, extra leaky and cause it to vasodilate and cause it to be full of edema. And, that's, and then it also triggers these mucus cells, which are respond to acetylcholine, right? It causes them to uh, produce mucus. So obviously we want to give antihistamines. We want to give mast cell uh, uh, destabilizers. We want to give things that stop prostaglandin formation. We want to give things that stop the formation of leukotrienes and stop this whole process from occurring in the first place. Okay, and then we have eosinophils also are there. Those are some of our white blood cells. So these are separate from mast cells, separate from our dendritic cells. These are cells that are going to release all these chemicals, you know, in response to the mast cells degranulating, in response to this immune response. Okay, so we have all kinds of interleukins that, that occur, that get released. And then we have, again, acetylcholine, right, is going to create mucus, right? Remember we said mentioned acetylcholine is part of, makes everything juicy. So acetylcholine makes our airways juicy with mucus. And then also acetylcholine, before, you know, that, that's helpful, it also bronchoconstricts. So we don't want acetylcholine around. So what kind of medications do we give these patients? Cholinergics or anticholinergics? We give them anticholinergics. And we also give patients, uh, we give patients uh, adrenergics or anti-adrenergics. Adrenaline being epinephrine or norepi, right? We give these patients epi, right? Epi is going to vasodilate, vasoconstrict and bronchodilate. It, that's gonna, it's gonna be our counter to histamine, okay? So epi and norepi are great at bronchodilating. That's what we always said with beta blockers when we talked about cardiac is caution and asthmatics because you're beta blocking. You're, not pre you're preventing the ability of the body's natural way to bronchodilate. That's the only way the body can bronchodilate is through norepinephrine and epinephrine. Okay, so in an emergency, these guys should be carrying around an EpiPen, right, to be able to inject themselves if they feel their airway start to constrict. Okay, also we have, before that happens, we have, um, we have bronchodilators, right, like, like such, sorry, adrenergic, beta, um, beta adrenergics, ones that will be, they can inhale real quick, and they can inhale a couple times, and if it's not getting better, they need to actually seek out 911 and seek out help. Seek out help. And how do they know it's not getting better? It could be very, very subjective. Yeah, I feel a little better. We can actually measure it with that peak flow meter I talked about. You can measure it. They start getting from the green zone to the yellow zone to the red zone. Okay? So the vagus nerve is involved at, at, in causing all of this nerve activation and break, break, uh, bronchoconstriction, but also goes to the, the mucus and starts creating mucus problems. So here's my cholinergic hyperreactivity. So my vagus nerve is ready to go, and my vagus nerve is going to cause mucus secretion. And it's also caused my bronchioles to bronco what? Constrict or dilate? 
bronchoconstrict. Acetylcholine is an, an a parasympathetic, causes bronchoconstriction. Sympathetic is bronchodilation. When you're running away from a bear, you want to be bronchodilated, and you want to get as much air as possible into your lungs. All right, and some of these interleukins we're going to point out because we have medications that block them. So we're going to block interleukin-3. Interleukin-3 activates more mast cells. That's a problem. So we have a medication that blocks specifically interleukin-3. We have a medication that specifically blocks interleukin-4, which releases IgE. And IgE is usually found in allergies. And so if someone has allergic asthma, you know, we can give them this medication. And then IL-5, interleukin-5, that blocks eosinophils, or that's going to do make more eosinophils. We know eosinophils are part of the, part of the problem. So we give medication that blocks interleukin-5. Interleukin-5 is one of the things that's going to cause, you know, gets released and gets more eosinophils involved, right? Interleukin-3 gets more mast cells involved. And then interleukin-3, we got other, other things that are going to stimulate this whole immune response. So we're trying to shut it down as much as possible, okay? So that's the goal with asthma. So it's all happened because of some little trigger out there, okay? Some trigger, some allergen of some sort, trigger this whole immune response. And then now the next time, now it's prepared for the next time. And then now it's going to be even a worse immune response. Immune response. Controller, that's the word I was looking for. It's, it's and preventer. These things are, are, are um, medications that we're going to give to prevent this allergic attack to happen again, right? So one of our medication therapies is to prevent asthma attacks. And we get, make sure they're on the medications, make sure they know how to use the medications as well. Okay, so we have all these up these triggers here, and eventually we get airway obstruction, we get bronchial constriction, we get airway swelling, we got mucus production. So we want to shut that process off. All right, so symptoms of asthma. So if you have no airflow into your lungs, you're going to get hypoxic, right? You're not going to get oxygen in, down into the alveoli if the bronchioles up top are constricted. So these bronchioles up top are constricted, we're not going to get air into the lungs down at the bases, right? So those airways need to be opened up with medications. But in the meantime, what kind of symptoms will the patient have? They're going to have symptoms of hypoxia. So what are hypoxia symptoms? We'll talk about that next, but uh, they have, well, I'll just go talk about it now. So you have symptoms of hypoxia, and that's going to have, SNS is going to fire off, right? So your low O2 is a natural trigger for the SNS. So they're going to have increased what? Respiratory rate, increased heart rate, right? They're going to feel palpitations. They're going to have a feeling of impending doom. They're going to have anxiety. They're going to have a diap some diaphoresis. These are all an SNS response, right? The blood pressure will go up. These are signs that the SNS is firing, right? Because they are hypoxic. When your hypoxic, get, hypoxic gets even worse and worse and worse, besides the SNS, what are other symptoms of hypoxia? Is they're not going to be able to talk in complete sentences. So that is a hypoxic patient. So you can describe that in your charting, saying patient able to speak in full sentences. That's good. They're probably a little more stable. But if they're unable to speak in full sentences, they can speak in two to three words or one word, right, sentences, that's a worse off patient. An inability to lie flat. So, you know, raising the head of bed is usually always the right answer. And it's the right answer with anything airway related. You're going to raise the head of the bed because these guys actually are going to want to be leaning forward. And when they lean forward to, to, get, to, to fix their shortness of breath, that's called orthopnea. Orthopnea is relief of shortness of breath leaning forward and unrelief or worsening shortness of breath lying down. Right? So that's what orthopnea is. They have to feel better. They, they, their, their air hunger improves when they lean forward. Right? So you'll find them leaning forward like this or on a bedside table, or they might, as kids, they'll be like tripoding. We'll see if one of these kids has asthma, right? When they, when they, when they you know, they're like in the playground and they are, uh, their knees are bent, they're like, like they're just sitting down tripoding, okay? So tripoding or orthopnea are symptoms of worsening hypoxia. So it's getting worse and worse and worse. And then next is accessory muscle use. So accessory, you have accessory muscles. And what are accessory muscles? Muscles you don't need? No. Accessory muscles are muscles that are used in excess to help breathe, right? You usually have internal intercostals and external intercostals that are contracting. Right now when you're breathing, no one looks in distress right now, right? So that, that's just your normal breathing pattern, right? And if you want to really breathe in more air, you're going to involve more muscles. And you can voluntarily say, okay... I'm going to bring in a lot more muscles, right? So you can bring your scalenes up here, your sternocleidomastoids in your, in your upper neck, and you can, you can use your abdomen to really get a big breath in there, 
right? You can use, these are all accessory muscles to help bring in more air. But when you are actually air hungry, your body's gonna start involving those whether you want to or not, right? So you can see here we got retractions occurring. This guy has the, a lot of retractions and is um, really vi uh, visual, visual uh, vivid, I should say, uh, intercostal retractions. This guy has his sternocleidomastoid and his scalenes are really, really prominent. He's really breathing in a lot more air right now. He's really struggling to breathe in that, that breath. Okay, so what else? We have and pecs can be involved as well. And then finally, for hypoxia, these all all a progression, right? So first of all, they might get a little tachycardic, tachypnic, I can't, you know, I feel a little short of breath, to the point where they can't speak in full sentences, to where they're orthopnic, to where they have accessory muscle use, so finally, they start saying, you know what, I'm tired. I'm just going to go to sleep right now. That's not a good sign. Or they're getting more and more confused because the oxygen to the medulla is not getting its, 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 uh, its fair due, its fair share. Or the oxygen of the reticular activated system is not getting its oxygen. So it start, starts shutting down, right? So, and then lately, then finally, you get blue. That, that's cyanosis. So cyanosis is always a late sign. It's never early, okay? So those are all signs of hypoxia. So someone with a with asthma gets hypoxia. So when COPD gets hypoxia. So when pulmonary edema, hypoxia. Pleural effusion, hypoxia. Bronchiectasis, hypoxia. So fibrosis, hypoxia. Some rare alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, hypoxia. Some, uh, you know, CP, all, it's, it's hypoxia. You just copy and paste it every single time. It's always hypoxia. It's never gonna change, okay? The only thing that changes is like pulmonary edema has hypoxia plus pulmonary edema of crackles, right? On auscultation, maybe some x-ray findings. But what does asthma have? Has hypoxia plus sputum. And we've, we've said why, because those that vagus nerve is hyperreactive or those mucus cells are being squeezed out, right? So you can get some chest tightness and wheezing as well. Wheezing is a classic sign of asthma, All right? So they have this wheezing because the airways are what? Bronchoconstricted or dilated? I'm hearing wheezing. Okay, you're hearing wheezing. Well, what do you think's going on? Um, now look, remember this. If you hear a wheeze, think AAC. Asthma, anaphylaxis, COPD. As a bonus, don't forget to do an EK. All right, so asthma is a classic sign of wheezing. Okay, so what else? So besides hypoxia, sputum, and wheezing, we get a lot of cough. So a lot of coughing activity, and because of all that sputum that's in, that's in there, it's gonna irritate the airways. So that's gonna be a, um, another symptom of asthma. And then it usually happens more at night. And sometimes we teach them, you know, it's time to seek out care or call 911. If you are waking up more than two times a night, you really have all this coughing that's making it difficult to you know, conduct your ADLs, that's gonna probably be a reason to seek out care. And then what else? Uh, a really important piece to see if someone has asthma is do, were they recently exposed, right? So you have all these symptoms of hypoxia, sputum, coughing, chest tightness, all these things. And then you say, yeah, I was out exercising in the cold and I ran into a cockroach pit and I fell over and found fluffy. It's like, well, shoot, I think I know why you might, ha you might have asthma. Just, just a guess, I might hazard a guess there. Right, so they can say, well, what caused it? When does it happen? So these are things that are you know, assessed during asthma. And usually you can say, well, do you have an inhaler? Are you using it? Because an important teaching point is use your inhaler. Okay, make sure you got, you're looking for pets, dust, certain foods can trigger asthma, dairy and such. 